Welcome to a Crossridge Christmas Eve. My name's Andy, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's my job to welcome you, our Crossridge family, friends, neighbors, and people who just happened upon this video on Facebook or YouTube. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. If you're new with us or have questions about Crossridge, how you can get connected or find out more about Christmas or what it means to be a follower of Jesus, we would love to talk to you. Visit crossridgechurch.ca where you'll be able to fill out a connect card to let us know more about you, ask questions and leave prayer requests. You can also subscribe to the Crossridge weekly email to stay up to date with events, classes and other things that'll be picking back up in the new year. If you don't already have a church you call home, we would love to invite you back online at least for the time being. On Sunday mornings at 10, we have our regular Sunday live stream. We would love to see you there. You can like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit crossridgechurch.ca for quick access to the live stream each week. The Christmas Eve service at the Clova has been a highlight for so many of us for nearly 10 years. Each year we've come in from the cold, having driven or walked under the twinkling lights of 176th Street into a dimly lit theater to sing carols and reflect on the Christmas story and light candles and to just sit and celebrate with our church family. Well, obviously we can't do that. So we took the opportunity to try something a little different. A couple of weeks ago, we got the band together to record some songs. Last week, Lee preached a sermon to a big empty room. Instead of figuring out lobby decorations and treats, we planned out camera angles and lighting and microphone placement. The result is what you're seeing tonight. Something that we hope will be an encouragement to you. It certainly has been to me. And we all need encouragement, don't we? We recognize that this season isn't easy for many of us at the best of times. And that this year, the added challenges have threatened to strip away what joy remains. It's our hope and prayer that even though things aren't as they should be, these songs, this reminder from the Bible, they will all point us to the hope that we have in the return of Jesus to set things right and fulfill all his promises. Because we're waiting. Much like Israel was waiting for their promised Messiah, the season of Advent draws attention to the things we're waiting on. And on each of the four Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve, we've lit a candle, representing the various themes of Advent, hope, peace, love, and joy. And then on Christmas Eve, we light a fifth candle representing the coming of Jesus, the light of the world. Well, if you have an Advent candle that you've been lighting along with us, now's the time to get that ready. Let's read this together. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. And so, we light this candle to symbolize the light of Jesus coming into the world to bring us a better hope, a better peace, a better love, and a better joy. If you have a curbside Christmas pack, crack it open and grab the candles so they're ready to go at the end of the service, or just grab any old candle from around the house to have at the ready. And now, if you can, turn the lights way down and the sound way up and join us in the Clova for tonight's Crossridge Christmas Eve service. I'll see you again later on this evening, but until then, from all of us here at Crossridge, Merry Christmas.
and makes the nations prove the glories of His righteousness and wonders of His love and wonders of His love and wonders, wonders of His love. Crossroads kids, we are so excited that you are joining us today. We ho ho hope that you are enjoying the holidays. I just love Christmas. What are some of the things that you think about when you hear the word Christmas? Uh, angels and presents. Wise men and shepherds. And definitely Jesus. Absolutely. There are so many wonderful things that Christmas brings to mind. When we hear our Bible story today, see if you can notice some of the words that were mentioned. Mary and Joseph lived in the town of Nazareth. During the time Mary was pregnant, the Roman Emperor Caesar Augustus announced that everyone needed to be registered for a census. Since Joseph was a descendant of King David, he and Mary traveled to Bethlehem, the city of David. While they were there, the time came for Mary to have her baby. Mary and Joseph looked for a safe place to stay, but every place was full. So Mary and Joseph found a place where animals were kept, and that is where Mary had her baby. Joseph named him Jesus. Mary wrapped the baby tightly in cloth and laid him in a feeding trough. That night, some shepherds were watching over their sheep in the fields near Bethlehem. Suddenly, an angel stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I have very good news for you and for all the people. Today, a savior who is the Messiah and the Lord was born for you in the city of David. Then the angel said, you will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a whole army of angels appeared, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels left and returned to heaven, Ooh. the shepherds decided to go see if the angels' words were true. They hurried to Bethlehem and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the feeding trough. Then the shepherds went and told others about the baby Jesus. Everyone who heard about Jesus was surprised and amazed. Mary thought about everything that was happening and tried to understand it. The shepherds returned to their fields, praising God because everything had happened just as the angel said. The birth of Jesus was good news. Jesus was not an ordinary baby. He is God's son sent to earth from heaven. Jesus, the promised savior, came into the world to deliver us from sin and death. Incredible. Can you even imagine what it was like to travel from Nazareth to Bethlehem? The journey for Mary and Joseph was long, about 145 kilometers long, and cars hadn't even been invented yet. When they got there, Mary needed a safe place to have her baby. Imagine knocking on doors to find a place to stay, only to discover that every place was already full. So Mary and Joseph went to a place where animals were kept, and that is where Jesus was born. 
Do you know why Mary's baby was called Jesus? Matthew 1.21 tells us that an angel came to Joseph in a dream and told him that the baby should be called Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The birth of Jesus was good news. Jesus was no ordinary baby. He's God's son sent to earth from heaven. Jesus, the promised savior, came into the world to deliver us from sin and death. Let's pray together and thank God for the wonderful gift of Jesus. Lord, you are working out your perfect plan to save sinners when you send your son into the world as a helpless baby at just the right time. We praise Jesus as the Prince of Peace and look to him as a light shining in a dark world. Thank you for this amazing gift. Amen. We hope that you enjoyed learning about the wonderful moment when Jesus came to earth. Head on over to crossridgekids.ca and ask an adult to print out the activity page and craft that go with our Christmas lesson. Thanks for spending time with us today and a very Merry Christmas to you all. shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby, lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said to them about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, 
But Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. I want to begin by welcoming all of you who found your way to our live stream, A Very Merry Christmas. Christmas looks different this year. Christmas Eve feels very different. We're not gathered in hundreds this year. You might be gathered with just your immediate family, or maybe you're gathered with one or two others, or maybe uh, you're on your own and tuning into this. However, we're celebrating. The Christmas celebration is no less significant. As a church, we have spent the month of December celebrating the theme or exploring the theme of a better Christmas. And we've taken the traditional themes of Advent and looked at what it means to say that Jesus is a better hope, a better peace, a better love, and a better joy. And tonight, as we celebrate Christmas Eve, I want us to focus our attention on the best Christmas. The best Christmas was the first Christmas. It is because of that first Christmas that we have Christmas at all. One of the distinct memories I have from Christmas as a child is maybe not surprisingly opening presents on Christmas morning. Now this didn't happen every year, but some years as we did that, 
after we thought all of the gifts had been opened, my dad would get this kind of funny look in his eyes and he would say something like, oh, I think I see one more present. And sure enough, he would reach under the couch or reach into the closet and pull out one final present. This present was usually wrapped in different paper than all the others that we had opened. The look on my mom's face would communicate that this present was a surprise even to her. Like I said, it didn't happen every year, but every year we kind of hoped that it would happen. As kids, we knew that when we saw that gift, dad had spoken, and usually that final gift was the best gift of all. We see something similar in the passage I'm going to read for you this evening. This passage comes from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, and it says this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Well, that might not be the first passage that comes to mind when you think about Christmas. We are more used to meditations about shepherds and angels and innkeepers and wise men. But that passage really does capture the essence of Christmas. As a matter of fact, that brief passage summarizes the message of the entire Bible. And I'm going to highlight just three truths related to this passage that teach us about the Christmas story and what it's really all about. The first truth is that God has always sought to communicate with us. And we sometimes think that Christmas began with the angelic announcement, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Now most of us know that we need to go a little bit further back than that. And often we will go back nine months to the angel's visitation of Mary. Where it says, And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. Christmas didn't actually begin with either of those events. If we want to understand the origins of Christmas, we need to go back much further in time. Christmas began in the heart of God before the foundation of the world. The book of Hebrews begins with the words, long ago. And these words remind us that the Christmas story is not actually the beginning of a new story, but the continuation of a much older story. Specifically, the passage says long ago, at many times and in various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And what that tells us is that God has always sought to communicate with us and that he's used a variety of means to do so. This is the story of the Old Testament. It's really a startling message. It's not surprising to hear that the creator of the universe made us But it is surprising to think that he longs for a relationship with us and desires to communicate with us. The Old Testament is really a record of God's relationship with his people and his constant attempts to communicate his love for them. As you read through the Old Testament, you will see the numerous ways that God spoke and communicated with his people. God spoke at many times and in many ways. He spoke to Moses from a burning bush. He spoke to Joseph through dreams. He spoke to Job in the whirlwind. He spoke to Elijah in a whisper. He spoke to Daniel in a vision. The list could go on and on. Story after story tells us how God communicated with his prophets, and then his prophets were sent to communicate with his people. But there was one great difficulty. This message was not getting through. There was nothing wrong with the message or the messengers, But the people who heard the message either ignored it or rejected it altogether. God was communicating, but we weren't listening. So how do you bridge a communication gap like that? Well, Upon hearing sounds in the dark, a little girl became afraid and couldn't sleep. 
She rushed into her parents' bedroom, begging to sleep in their bed, but they refused. Instead, they prayed with her, sent her back to her room, and told her to remember that God was with her. She went back to her room and tried to sleep, but it didn't work. So she ran back into her parents' room and again asked to sleep in their bed, but again they refused and said, look, God is with you. Go back to your room. So she went again to her room and tried to sleep, and again it didn't work. So she made her way to her parents' room one more time. This time they were a little bit less patient. Didn't we pray with you, they scolded? Didn't we tell you and assure you that God is with you? What's the problem? And her reply was classic. God doesn't have any skin on him. H.B. Charles said, before the incarnation, every method God used to declare his love was misunderstood. God didn't have any skin. So his expressions of love were viewed as acts of tyranny. In the incarnation, God perfectly declared his love for us. He spoke in a language we could understand. He did so by becoming one of us. In fact, the term incarnation literally means in the flesh. And this takes us to the second truth we discover about Christmas, which is that God's communication found its fullest expression in Jesus. This is the message of Christmas. Long ago, at many times and in various ways, God spoke to our forefathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Jesus is God's gift to a world that had turned its back on him and stopped listening. The most famous Bible verse of all puts it this way, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. See, all the prophets who came before Jesus, all of the presents, all of the messages that God had sent were in a sense wrapped in the same paper. Jesus was a completely different kind of gift. He came in different wrapping. I don't mean the swaddling cloths that he was wrapped in at his birth. Jesus came as the Son of God, wrapped in human flesh. Verse 3 goes on to say, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. Everything that is true about God was seen in the person of Jesus. Listen to a sampling of the way other New Testament writers express this. The Gospel of John put it this way, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory from the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. On one occasion, Philip, one of Jesus' disciples said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the father? The Apostle Paul said this about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. And elsewhere he said, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. The Apostle John reminds us that no one has ever seen God, but that Jesus, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. And what all of this means is that while the prophets could tell people what God was like, Jesus could show them. Well, the prophets could speak about God's mercy. Jesus came and showed and demonstrated God's mercy. People sometimes wonder, what is God really like? Well, we don't have to guess. The Bible's answer to that question is to point to Jesus. Jesus is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature. This is why we can say that God's communication with us found its fullest expression in Jesus. But there is more to say. The third thing we learn about the Christmas story here is that God's communication with us was costly, but yielded great dividends. The life of Damien de Wooster is a fascinating story. Damien de Wooster spent the last 17 years of his life serving as a medical missionary on the island of Molokai in Hawaii in the latter part of the 1800s. 
Molokai was the island that Hawaiians who had leprosy were sent away to or exiled to. Leprosy causes nerve damage and muscle damage. And one of the effects of leprosy is numbness or decreased sensitivity to pain in the hands, arms, and feet. It was at one time thought to be highly contagious. And so sufferers were often sent away to leper colonies in isolation. The leper colony on Molokai was one of the largest in the world. Damien de Wooster developed a love for the people of Molokai. He embraced them. He built a chapel for them. He taught them. Eleven years into his residency on the island, something significant happened. One morning as he was pouring boiling water from a kettle into a cup, some of that water spilled out and landed on his bare foot. He didn't feel it took him a moment to realize exactly what had happened. And so he took some of that boiling water and he carefully poured it onto his other foot and he again felt nothing. And in that moment, he realized that he himself had contracted leprosy. Up until that day, Damien de Wooster began every sermon with the words, my fellow believers. But that day he began his sermon with the words, my fellow lepers. In a small way, that helps us understand something of what the incarnation is all about and what it costs Jesus. The full text of verse 3 says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And then it says, After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know, to a lot of people, the last part of verse 3 sounds like a bit of a record scratch for a Christmas Eve message after making purification for sins. But we ought not to disconnect these two things. We ought to remember the words in the angel's announcement to Joseph when he announced the coming birth of Jesus. And he said, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So how does Jesus do that? How did Jesus make purification for sins? How does he save his people from their sins? Well, this is where the parallel with Damien de Wooster is helpful. Jesus entered our world, and Jesus did more than take our leprosy upon him. Jesus took all of our sin and all of our shame Upon himself. Elsewhere, the Apostle Paul says it this way For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This is what I mean by saying that God's communication with us was costly. Jesus left his throne in heaven, he entered our world as a helpless baby, but more than that, he offered up his perfect life in exchange for ours. I told you that these verses not only help us understand the Christmas message better, but in fact, they help us understand the message of the entire Bible. Now, we know there was a 30-year gap between Jesus' entrance into the world as a baby and his death and resurrection. On our calendars, there's a three- or four-month gap between the events of Christmas and Easter. But from a biblical perspective, you cannot separate these events. You cannot separate the events of Christmas from the events of Easter. It's important for us to meditate on the significance of the incarnation, on Jesus becoming one of us. But in reality, the events of Jesus' incarnation, his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his glorification ought to all be understood together. Listen to this familiar passage from the book of Philippians that, like this passage in Hebrews, ties everything together. And it says this, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. That's the incarnation. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. That's the crucifixion. Therefore, God has highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the resurrection and the glorification of Jesus. This is good news. I said that God's communication with us was costly, but I also said that it yields great dividends, and those dividends are what we experience. And what I want to say here and what I want to leave you with is the truth we discover at the very end of verse 3. After making purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And the reason that is good news is because Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father. And this means that the Christmas story is not over. Later in the book of Hebrews, we read this. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. So as we think about the wonder of Christmas, it ought to lead us first to the cradle and then to the cross and ultimately to the crown where Jesus sits on his throne and he reigns and he rules in this world. Well, my prayer for you as we conclude our celebration of Christmas together is the one that we've been praying throughout this month from the book of Romans. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. Stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill.
Well, thanks so much for joining us tonight. We hope that this strange celebrating together apart on a Christmas Eve like this has been an encouragement to you and a reminder of what it is that we're here to celebrate, the great gift that we have that came from God the Father in his son, Jesus, coming to earth for us. It's been a long tradition here at Cross Ridge to close out our Christmas Eve service singing Silent Night together, turning off the lights, and lighting a candle, and passing the flame around to those with us, symbolizing the light and love of God that has come to us in the form of Jesus that we can then pass on to those around us. So if you picked up one of those Christmas Eve packs, or maybe you just have some candles kicking around the house, grab those now. We'll light those as we sing together and just pass them to one another. And we're going to turn down the lights and close out this way. Merry Christmas to you, and we pray that you go in the peace and hope and love and joy of Jesus. Amen. Mm-hmm.